Bien, euh, donc nous pouvons reprendre nos discussions. Donc ce, ce, ce panel va s'intéresser à la question de, de l'activisme artistique dans l'espace urbain, avec différents euh, exemples, euh, à travers les communications d'Alberto Dumon, de Laurence Corbel et de Marie Escoron. Donc, est-ce que Alberto est connecté Eh bien, oui. Je le vois. Euh, du coup. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Hello. Good, and we can Hello. hear you. Perfect. And no echo. Okay. Great. So, Great. Just a second. Um, I'm just trying to grab your bio. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> Let them read it. Let them read it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll read this. It's, Donc, Alberto et moi nous met in, in London a couple of years ago, and I thought it would be nice to, uh, to have you in this um, in this conference. But you haven't given any bio, I realize. So I'll introduce you <laughs> as <laughs> thank you <laughs> as um, so you're a lecturer. You, you correct me if I'm wrong at Middlesex University, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and you lead a program, uh, a master's program entitled Art of Social Practice. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, you, you're going to, to tell us a bit more about your practice as, a, as an artist yeah. Yeah. as well today. Uh, so I, I guess you're going to speak in English. Um, I'm afraid so, yeah. Je suis désolé, mais uh, je vais dire de bêtises uh, si je parle français uh, dans yeah. cette façon-là. Your, your, your French is great. Um, no, without no. further ado, let's, uh, let's hear your, your presentation. Um, do you need me to be able to share or am I already? Yeah, you should, yeah. Yeah, you should be able to. Yeah? Yeah, is that working? Great. Let's see. If you, you, you like to tell me if you see. It's, it's working. Oh, I yep. see. It's great. To, uh, okay. Great. Fabulous. Okay. okay. Can, can so you give us a bigger picture of uh, that first slide? Yeah, sure. I will. I was just going to do a okay. brief, okay. brief Off intro. You. Off you go. Merci. Bon, alors, uh, first of all, uh, merci bien uh, for the invitations. This is obviously the, the postponed versions of what could have been a year ago in Bordeaux, and it would have been lovely to be there with you in the flesh. Um, or IRL, as is now become the way to say it in real life. Um, and the purpose of that sort of uh, presence was also to involve you in what I had prepared as a workshop. So what you see today is a sort of a, a, a presentation version of the work that I do that involves usually the participations of classrooms, um, conference speakers, community groups in various different environments. And it's the result of what I, I see, I realize immediately that I find myself here as a kind of in-betweener, which is perhaps the perfect place to be considering that we are trying to define a space in between. And it's not the space in between art and activism that I'm interested in, because as a practitioner, I think I'm I'm much more interested in the kind of the desire of the practitioner to operate and to set their own field for uh, someone else then to um, read into. But the, the, the two fields that I'm trying to always uh, put together is research. So a research-led artistic practice or an art-led research output. I always find myself in conferencing in between spaces. I am an artist that writes and research, and I'm a researcher that practices. And I think that already defines the perhaps the ultimate resolution of these tensions that very often on a theoretical level seems to be 
insurmountable and they have to arrive at some kind of settlements, which is never what the artists actually seek. The artists never seek those kind of settlements. Uh, and in that place, I say that perhaps I define myself as an artist in order to grab the um, license and the legitimacy to be free in my way of operating. And I use the, the, the more uh, strict category of researcher in order to be able to bring to my practice a much wider body of contextualization and understanding of what I'm doing and why am I doing it. And also uh, as an educational tool, which is why I think that this was supposed to be a workshop in the first place. Because I do, I do these kind of things with my students or with different groups for different reasons, as you will see. So first of all, the title, Reclaim the Streets, that already resonates, if you're familiar with that particular kind of practice, with a real uh, existing form and traditional form of activist uh, sort of actions, which is historically based in the uh, UK and in London. It belongs to the 90s. And Reclaim the Streets was a way to reoccupy, was a kind of a, a let's say, a, 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 a daddy of Occupy. Uh, in many ways, um, Reclaim the Streets turned uh, uh, as a kind of a guerrilla group, urban spaces into um, um, assemblies, um, pretend beaches or, or festivals in order to interrupt the everyday life. So it was an intervention, a situationist inspired interventions that disrupted everyday life as a form of interruption. And I'm using that uh, not casually, but with a particular intention, but spaced in a in a in a very interesting kind of um, leap in a very in a different timeline. So what I'm trying to say is that in this kind of moments that I, I want to present to you, the notion of reclaiming the streets is applied to a kind of a sociology, urban sociology of future spaces yet to exist. So it's speculative fiction as action. It's uh, science fiction in a way as a form of social action. And I will articulate all this as you see what I'm trying to do. So why I've talked, I, 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 I mentioned before in the, in the uh, title, Talking Ghosts, because I've individuated very specific agents. And these are the, the, in a sense, the actors that, that are used in this particular action. And they are called talking ghosts because they are the people that populate the CGI created urban spaces of new housing, public space development, advertising their forthcoming arri arrival. Now, these are the hoardings that you find around developments, advertising through imagery, through sophisticated visual digital renderings, the spaces yet to exist of the city. And those are spaces populated in a very uh, panoramic kind of tableau uh, renditions of spaces that do not yet exist, but they are already occupied by a certain kind of urban actors of citizens yet to exist. So these are what they called sort of like um, uh, um, using Robert Smithson ruin in reverse, but using the idea of ghost in reverse as spectral future citizens of the city. So they are spectral because they are ghosts that are embodying us before we actually arrive there. So they are future citizens of the city yet to exist and therefore present in the affective atmospheres that prefigure the future city through marketing and management. So perhaps pin that affective atmosphere as a way of resolving that idea of where art and activism exist. And I think that the idea of affective atmospheres is something I will develop sometimes through. Uh, so these are, for instance, some of these actors. This is uh, Sophia, a CGI character that uh, acts and, and poses um, as real, but of course reveals um, a wireframe uh, throughout. These are uh, packages that you buy. Um, they are uh, made uh, by various companies, mostly um, European and uh, US based. 
and they come in packages. Like, for instance, this is a, a worker bundle discounted at 265 euros. It's a good deal if you want to take advantage. These are basically all characters that you can then pose and, and act in all possible ways. These are obviously supermarket uh, context, but there are even funnier contexts. This is a, is, is a sauna package um, that I'm not sure exactly why you would want to sort of uh, parcel some some sort of a story and narrative within a sauna as if for marketing purposes. But I leave you to wonder why these packages exist anyway. To enact the yet to exist, to make it plausible. So. I think that uh, research has paid attention to these characters only very recently because I think there is still this dominant idea that action has to actually uh, constitute uh, a, a, an effective uh, uh, sort of uh, register only if it happens in real life. But we know very well that by now CGIs are considered not just representations, and I'm quoting here one of the best researches that I, I draw your attention on, by three kind of sociologists and cultural sociologists and urban studies. Um, so CGI are not only representation, but actually have agency and become embedded in the construction of place, space, place, and social life through a powerful mobilizations and assemblage of people, skills, and ideas. So again, returning to the idea of atmospheres, I have sort of located these characters within this idea of affective atmosphere, both to bring us to the notion of affect, an idea of affectivism by Brian Holmes, which historically already back in 2008, uh, constructed this idea of what actually artists do in a certain kind of social space, and the notions of atmospheres that is becoming more and more important, I think, in defining spatial theories that um, are essentially immaterial. So these are defined by Tonino Grifero as quasi things, things that do not exist fully in the traditional sense as substances or events, yet they powerfully act on us and our states of mind. So you put these two things together, the, the notion of atmospheres and the notions of affective powers, and you suddenly realize where these CGI actors enact their own their own agency. Again, Gernot Bohm is probably one of the best known uh, philosopher that defines atmosphere. So if you want to kind of go and check that particular area, he's someone very good to read. And he defines this um, atmosphere as a, a vague power without visible and discrete boundaries, which we found, find around us and resonating in our lived body even involves us. So we're, we're speaking about immaterial entities, quasi things, vague powers, but still very much existing. And also I want to point to attention that of course, the reason why these um, agents are now given more relief also in research, because of course we have arrived at the point of CGI creation and um, sort of a digital rendering that uh, makes some theorists and practitioners um, ditch the famous uh, notions of the uncanny valley or, uh, or the place where it's impossible to clearly identify artificial intelligence from human uh, uh, agencies or digital renderings from actual uh, footage. So this idea that this is actually a very great uh, short video that you can find in Alan Warburton's website where you can see him reasoning that we perhaps have left the uncanny valley and so we are entering into a new phase and uh well this is a probably i'm not sure we ever seen this but this is jeff bezos um fake uh deep fake speaking so that oh. is actually a fake jeff bezos that speaks about a particular fake Amazon series that he promotes in which he declares at the end that Amazon will give 25% of all his profits to uh, the uh, Amazon forest sort of uh, conservation project, which is clearly completely a construction uh, of, of a speculative fiction in order to affect 
a particular area of debate in environmental policies and all of this. But of course, the reason why I'm speaking about urban studies in terms of urban development and what is interesting is that, of course, urban developments are first and foremost spatial materialization or manifestation of global finance. And I have done a little bit of research about Bordeaux and I realized clearly how uh, Bordeaux is never, it's not immune to, to some of these financial speculation for all kinds of reasons, the arrival of the Eurostar, uh, the, the needs of students, the fact that there is a certain particular space in the city that needs to be reconfigured. And so my initial intention was to arrive in Bordeaux a couple of days before, go around and look for this kind of manifestation of digital rendering in the city as a uh, uh, sort of harbingers as four bodies of things to come, that they will manifest themselves in the space. But maybe it's, uh, it's something that will happen in the near future, in the next version of this symposium. So these are just some of the examples that, that are London-based, and you can see what I mean by the insertion of the real and uh, the fictitious or the speculative almost to an extent that they project its, it themselves into a continuation. So we are almost invited to enter in these spaces that are digital, but they are still manifest themselves as a, uh, uh, as a kind of oracle of future uh, social life of spaces. And we confront them in our own presence, but they are already speaking of a future that asserts itself as the future that will be. So, so um, some of these, of course, have some sort of disclaimer. They tell you that there is computer-generated image for illustrative purpose, but they are still perfectly acting they, what they have, to, they have to enact. And in this particular case, you will see, actually, there's a whole possible kind of study one could uh, create in how these spaces, particularly when they involve museum and therefore the display of art, they have to generate a future idea of the museum, but they cannot use existing artworks for copyright reasons. So they actually create fictional artwork in order to show that that will be a museum. So you see these kind of like horrific kind of sculptures that are shown in this uh, soon to exist museums that do not exist yet, but they are still present in their visualization. So there are some kind of strange crossover between, I don't know, Th Thomas Stutter kind of uh, aluminium uh, strange figures and, and some bizarre um, uh, algorithmic renditions of um, contemporary art sculptures. But what I'm interested in is in the point in which these kind of things start to come together in the real city, in the real life of the streets in which they, they enact their power of asserting the future. And the strangest things happen, like for instance, in this particular uh, kind of hoardings that are found in Riga, you find the same character twice at a very short distance within the same rend rendering. So she's taking a picture of herself, taking a pictures and, and these kind of strange quirk of glitches of rend renderings are actually starting to become very, very interesting. Things become even more interesting when you start to analyze the actual characters that actually populate these um, renderings. And this um, is really around the corner for me. It's literally at 200 meters from where I'm speaking at the moment. Um, and it's a new, very large regeneration area in London called Tottenham Hill, where um, about 3,500 new dwellings are all appearing at once uh, in, and they are all phased in the next few years. So I would like you to pay attention to some of these figures. And, um, and here's another uh, rendering completely from a different context. This is from Helsinki and is part of a, another massive development that has just received planning permission after years and years of litigation. Remember that Helsinki is also the city that said no to the Guggenheim a few years ago in a very important kind of uh, precedent for how these large museums actually enter these spaces. And notice that figure uh, in the middle. And here is a confrontation where the same digital characters appears in a rendering in, for a development in Helsinki and here for this for another development totally different but in Tottenham Hill. So here it is this kind of dapper young black man speaking 
in different situations. So these are characters that essentially are global constructs that are populating social life of future spaces, regardless of where they are actually positioned. So there are instances of this kind of globalized colonizer, that, and it's really interesting that I'm speaking of the word colonizer with by, by taking the image of a young black man. Um, and I'm gonna use this term colonizing again. This is a selection of several of the photographs of these hoardings with the various renderings. In some cases, they are royalty-free images rather than digital ones. In some cases, they are very badly cut and pasted, various degree of quality. But you can see, for instance, look at this image of kind of domination over the city. It's, it's a kind of a classic thing, so, or classic yoga poses, of course, because where will we be without well-being and fitness in these propositions? Um, but of course, as you can see, for instance, the rain in this case creates a strange effect in that particular images, almost like, as if she's actually crying um, in, a, in what is supposed to be a place of arrival, of property, of happiness, of realizations of one's own consumption. So just to sum this up and, and to quote something that is, for me, one of the best ways in which we define a certain present. This is Kirsten Ross from a great book called Communal Luxury, The Political Imaginary of the Paris Commune. And she says, in the utter uncertainty of the present, and this was written in 2016, we can only say that the utter uncertainty of the present has reached even more, uh, of, uh, higher degrees of uncertainties because of where we are. The time of the global institution and in its own planning, whether business or cultural seems not to matter anymore, and this is very important, cultural institution planning, is the one that asserts its ownership. It prefigures and articulate future urban landscape visually and orally, and set their goals to achieve them through marketing and management. So marketing and management are the weapons of these acts of prefiguration, of articulation, of future urban landscape, which are essentially acts of colonizations of the future. This is how the financial imaginations act. So we are, we are then entering into kind of future studies, which is a branch that in which I've done quite a lot of research in order to bring things together. And one of the best studies, although it's a few years old, but it's still one of the most comprehensive one, it was a, an EHRC funded three-year project called In Pursuit of the Future, where we see the term present future appearing. And the terms present future is very important because he approaches the future from the standpoint of the present, right? It projects the future as a terrain that is empty, open, and subject to colonization. So I'm not using the word colonization lightly here. I'm meaning as a sense that um, capital is obviously interested more than ever in resolving the utter uncertainties of present times, and normalize it by effectively colonizing the future ahead of us. And I see these images of renderings as one of the manifestation of these acts of colonizations. A colonization that says, no matter what your future is going to be, this future that I, I so finely detail in visual forms, that I make it exist for you in, visual, in visually plausible ways, exist, will exist, and is the future, the only future possible in this particular location, in this particular situation. So there are projections in the present from a present future in which marketing and management have already defined the terms of this social life that they forecast or they actually materialize in the most uh, detailed 4K or 8K super HD visual renderings. So futuring is actually a very buoyant uh, sector in management that, that really uses a systematic process for thinking about and planning for the future. A future that is understood as capitalizable, 
and with systematic immediacy of multiple plausible worlds involved in the consolidation of an oracular sensibility. The word oracular here comes in a sense of like future predicting. So uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 sort of um, investments in corporates is futuring. It's in the studies that somehow are providing to the company, to the, to the corporate, the capacity of knowing the future in advance or being in, in the positions of having a variety of capitalizable, plausible worlds in which the future of the corporation is secured, right? And the word future, I mean, in London, I, I see this, I have seen this, the word future almost like a spell. You, know, you, are, you use it almost like to cast a spell, a mantra, something that is manifested constantly. The use of the word future seems to bring already the future in existence. A certain future, though, the future that the London authorities in their various state and corporate collusions are creating for Londoners. And this is the Foundation for Future London, which is another name for the charity of the legacy of the Olympic Park. And of course, we are seeing this probably of uh, uh, Paris, people that are based in Paris that are doing exactly experiencing the very same thing taking place already for the arrival of Paris 2024. It's, it's, uh, these are forecasting, marketing and management that they take this colonizing sort of views. The future is culture. This is like uh, uh, another mantra. Um, not only when you these are these are hoardings from urban developments in 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 current constructions in in London engineer your future, which gives even more gives even more mechanistic kind of views of saying the future is a question of simply planning your choices, make them manifested, and fit them within an already manifested preset uh, present future in which all the options are already there available for you. No other futures. It goes to the extent of becoming something between ridiculous and obscene in the sale of the Greenwich Peninsula uh, development, which is still taking place. Actually, there was, we went through an ups and downs. There was a massive plan, then it was scaled down. Now it's picking back up. To an extent of, of really referring to the original manifest destiny image, imagery of the West conquest, right? The family, that uh, enters into an empty land, never mind the indigenous culture, never mind the, the actual residence. The urban is taken as a tabula rasa, is considered as, as an empty land, the land rush in which you can be one of the original. Evacuating completely is past, evacuating completely the agency of those who already occupy their space, the actual residence of that. Uh, uh, that uh, area prior to the arrival of this uh, vulture parasitic kind of uh, actions. So these are clearly irrational fictions, right? But as Keller Easterling says in this uh, particular extract from a brilliant book, Extra Statecraft, irrational fiction whose undeclared but consequential activities are perhaps the very thing then make them immune to righteous, righteous declaration and prescription. So the more the marketing fiction is irrational and they are nothing but irrational, and the more they seem to stick, the more this seems to work. We are living in a world which is constantly constructed by irrational marketing fictions that are extremely powerful exactly because they're irrational and they appeal to the affective atmospheres in which we become embedded in. So what to do? I mean, as an artist that claims to be set in a certain uh, idea of intervention or interventionist, in, an, in, an, in a city which is actually interrupted constantly as a strategy. So what to do with that situationist traditions of interruption in a city which is de facto interrupted by the forces of capital? And this is a very interesting quote by um, a, uh, a theorist called Abbas and is, is part of his great book, edited book called Interrupting Interruptions. So when cities themselves becomes essentially spaces of information, 
What happens to visual culture and interruption and as practices of resistance, right? I've inherited from, from previous radical pasts ideas of interruptions as a visual culture of resistance, as a practice of resistance, all mythologized in this kind of way. But where are we now? So it would be a false optimism to assume that interruption can expose the lie and give us the truth. One of the main instances for which activism occurs, right, is reveal, demystify, right, offer another worldview. But what it can do, however, is to create noise. And noise can take the form of protests, but also of artworks, performances, special construction, or theories. So in this way, I try to frame this kind of uh, presentations, and I'm going to now show you what I've actually what I'm actually doing, and what I was proposed to do with you if we were to, were in a situation of a workshop. It's something that I've done a, a few, for a few years now in very different contexts. It's called Talking Ghost: Collaborative Hoarding Novellas. I basically gather a group of people, which can be gathered because through invitation, or through a call out, or through part of a specific festival or through uh, agencies of activists that ask me to create a sort of a situation in which we can affect sort of urban discourse. And this is us in action. As you can see, is, is an intervention which is very similar to a detournement. The situation is detournement. It's almost like René Viette, uh, uh, peu la dialectique casser les briques, uh, you know. Um, it's, we are going, we are identifying very specific uh, hoardings from very specific uh, forms of urban development. We document them. We enter into a workshop space. We spend about three hours together discussing what we know about this uh, development and what we don't want to know. And we come up with a script. The script uses the characters as ventriloquists as agents to be embodied. They are silent agents from the future that tries to impose itself on us as its social life, but we're essentially reclaiming the streets that are documented in this particular moment by then inserting our own script. And the script is coming out of those sessions of conversations that they are coming out together by uh, working out what this person should do, what this character is, who this character is, um, what do you think he should say? And then we come, kind of work from left to right, or, and then we can go back and revisit. And then we print these um, speech bubbles and go and paste them on the actual hoarding. So the, all, the whole thing is iterative, it's circular. It creates itself and it manifests itself. Um, I'm going to tell you about how long these things last, but also how they are really, they cannot even be charged for any act of vandalism or um, billing or unlawful practice because you can peel them off literally. Um, so there's, there's no damage whatsoever that can be claimed as a form of legal. Um, this is, you know, it's someone that's serving drinks at the top of a terrace in a exclusive development and is the waitress and she's a student who is working in a shift and she's thinking how many shifts she still needs to do to repay a student loan. Um, so this is, um, these are various different posters that I show you that we've done every year on year uh, with very specific uh, ways of showing you So they're, they're, they are either informed or funny or um, discrediting or disclaiming the claims of the poster, depending on who's the people in the room. I mean, of course, with a, with a group like, like you, a very group of very well-informed scholars, um, it would have been interesting to see what kind of uh, sound bites, uh, what kind of responses we could have worked out for a very specific image of a development in Bordeaux, because you are aware of the context. So everywhere I would go, I'm in the hands of those who are actually capable of constructing the critique, that I'm only setting out the basic terms 
of opening it up. And in the process, we all learn from each other. So I've done it in several cities and I, and I would have done it in Bordeaux if, if it was possible. Uh, um, and it, this is how it happens. As you can see, um, I project the image of the uh, hoarding. Um, we come together, we pin some ideas, we work them through, yes, no, oh yes, actually I had an idea, this is great. Oh my God, I've got a great joke for that one. She will say that. Then we create label printed out of a, an A4 black and white printer. These are self-adhesive labels. Uh, cut them out, cut them out of speech bubble, and then we go out and post them. Uh, the average, I mean, let's say, I've, in all the cases that I've done it, the longest that one of these interventions ever lasted was actually about 12 days before the security guard of that development realized or someone posted it. It depends where it is in terms of visibility. If it was in the city center, um, in a very, very visible spot, you can imagine that we can put it on, we document it, we put it on social media immediately so it spreads uh, visually, but then in a space of a couple of hours, probably, the security guard of that uh, building site will, have, will eventually go through and find out and simply peel them off. But no damage is done. And the idea is that if, um, if COVID wouldn't have happened, for instance, in 2020, we had planned a multi-site uh, action here in London where 10 sites all at once would have been attacked exactly in this kind of way with the press alerted all throughout as a form of saying, who is this for? Because this is the main issue in London and it has been for a long, long time. What are these houses for? Who are they for? Who are they? What is this building boom benefiting? And of course, it's, it's definitely Londoners don't need to be expert in urban studies to understand what is who, who are these for and why they are not the target for these particular developments. So um, it's a kind of something that it crosses over an artistic action, a research in action, and an educational tool, and a form of um, creating a pedagogical conversation amongst citizens, amongst experts, amongst scholars. And here we are, I've just selected some of the things I found online about coming up developments in Bordeaux, where you could easily imagine these uh, being the target of the same kind of joyful um, uh, insurrectionary kind of ideas manifested into speech bubbles. I think that there is a lot coming over in Bordeaux um, in the future that could be very easily the target of this um, playful form of the tournament, um, which clearly uh, are not the action in themselves. They are simply the intermediate towards actions. They are, they're in a sense alerting to the possibility of actions. They're cheap, they're easy to do. They, you don't need a particular form of political knowledge to understand what these developments do in your city. It crosses over political spectrums as well in various different ways. And the interesting thing is that these actors, the actors that, that we use as ventriloquists are the same everywhere. And the reason why I also mentioned colonizing is because the vast majority, 99%, you would say, they are white and they are European. Guess what? Uh, with, with some exceptions, and the exceptions are equally traded in the same colonizing actions as standpoints, as kind of uh, standbys, bum doubles. They are sort of uh, uh, stunts, sort of uh, body doubles for us. And that's why I felt that the idea is everyone, as we enter the room, understand what we are there for, because those are people like us in the future. But we want them to speak different things than the one they stand for. So that's really it.